There's a lot of different kind of families in the world. But Christ's family is, is different. Christ's family forgives and loves their enemies. Christ's family willingly confesses sin and apologizes. Christ's family shares mercy. Christ's family says their prayers in the morning and during the day, whenever they need to, and at night. Christ's family, with a mustard seed of faith, moves mountains. Christ's family is different. So how has Christ's family been among us? Or do we feel a little puny in our faith? There are challenges in your life and my life where we find it very difficult at times to believe. Maybe you can relate to Jeff. This is titled Sunday School. Nine-year-old Jeff was asked by his mother what he learned in Sunday School. Well, Mom, our teacher told us how God sent Moses behind enemy lines on a rescue mission to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. When he got to the Red Sea, he, his engineers built a pontoon bridge and all the people walked across safely. Then he used his walkie-talkie to radio headquarters. They sent bombers to blow up the bridge and all the Israelites were saved. Now, Jeff, is that really what your teacher taught you, his mother asked? Well, no, Mom. But if I told it the way the teacher did, you'd never believe it. I mean, how many ways do you and I find ourselves wrestling with things and it's hard to believe? Ever stop saying prayers about specific things because you're beginning to think it's not going to work? It's too hard to believe? It's not always easy for us to engage whatever we're dealing with by faith. We'd rather settle with using our brains or our brawn or Google. How many ways are we tempted to give up on God and try to use our own ways by grit? Some of you had kids my, in my contemporary place spit and duct tape. And it doesn't work. But why do we often try to handle things on our own? Look how the Israelite army was doing when the shepherd boy came to big, bring provisions for his brothers. They weren't doing so well. Hardly a wonderful example of faith, right? And yet, David showed up, hearing the incredible abuse God was getting from Goliath, and he couldn't help but think, how dare you talk about God that way? And David, with just the stuff of a shepherd boy, faces the weapon of the Philistines and wins because he knows the victory is God's. I don't know how often I forget that. That the victory is God's. And that God cares about his family. Christ's family of faith has someone who has their back and seeks to take care of them. Even to rescue us from our unbelief. Today in our gospel reading, we hear of Jesus coming off the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, God has set him on the course to the cross. And so he is going there. He comes back to where his disciples are and the disciples are having an argument with the lawyers, the theological experts of the day. And I guess they're having some kind of an argument over this, this boy that's demon-possessed and nothing has worked. Apparently, they tried to cast out the demon and it didn't work. And so now there's an argument. I'm sure we could really dig into this. But what happens when Jesus asks the disciples, what, what were you arguing about? I mean, awkward silence. They're not saying anything, but who speaks up? The Father. Did you catch the Father's heart? Did you hear his sorrow and his angst over his son? 
And of course, Jesus knows everything, but he lets the Father talk and share the struggle that was a part of their life for we don't know how long. But no doubt, from what we heard, there was a tremendous amount of challenge in that family for quite some time. And it sounds to me that the father is almost at the end of everything. Even in how he asks Jesus for help. How did it go? But if you can do anything, if you can do anything, Lord, I've done everything. I guess it's about time to pray. Well, we may as well pray. Uh, don't forget to say your prayers. Oh, I forgot to say my prayers. Can we relate to the Father? Amen. We sometimes in our faith, we know where to go, but we wonder. But it's wonderful how Jesus ministers, well, ministers to the whole congregation. Before this, the Father explains to Jesus how the disciples weren't able to cast out the demon. And Jesus responds this way. Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. Sounds like Pastor Jesus is not having a very good day. Or maybe Pastor Jesus realizes what's the real problem. And it's not the son. It's the unbelief of the congregation. And no doubt, having a demon-possessed son is pretty heartbreaking. What the darkness of evil was doing to that family, no doubt was pretty heartbreaking and heart-wrenching. But far worse than that was the unbelief. In truth, all of our sin, all of our transgression is just manifestation of unbelief. And so Jesus now is going to address the bigger issue that doesn't just affect the son, the father, and their family, but the whole congregation that Jesus has come to for that very thing. Thank you, Jesus, for always showing up. Amen. And so here he is, and now he's got to go through this work of letting people understand, including the disciples, what the real problem is. And so he does that. But he does it in a way that maybe even looks a bit mean. And so they bring the son, and then Jesus asks more, and we heard that from the father, and we can hear the father's heart. We ache for the father. And maybe there are places in your life and my life where we find ourselves that the challenges can be so great, so impossible. But look what Jesus does. So when the father says, if you can, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And then Jesus says, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And that's true. But what is Jesus doing? He's helping the Father understand what's going on inside of him. And draws the Father to pray. I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. How many ways can you and I say that prayer over the course of a day, over the course of a week? How often 
in our prayers, we find ourselves, Lord, I'm praying again. I've got this confidence. Maybe we just need to also add, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Because that's a prayer request too. Far worse than the individual things in your life and my life is the unbelief that has a way of making us want to give up and doubt God or to rely on ourselves. And it's not that our skills and knowledge and abilities are bad. God has given you all kinds of gifts to use, but he wants you, he wants me to trust in him and not in them. He wants us to use those things, trusting that he will make a way. And that's what it's all about. And that's what Jesus addressed. And then he healed the son. And then the disciples asked, why couldn't we do it? And it sounds to me, how about you, that they failed to say their prayers. One of the most important things that you and I can do in our daily lives with the Lord and with one another is to take time to say a prayer. I know there are things in your life that are making you to say, say a prayer. And they're oppressing you. Just keep praying. And trust in the gospel. It's fascinating. Today, Paul says in a very kind of, uh, what would you call it, in a pedantic way, in a parochial way, in a Sunday school way, the gospel. And there are four points to it. That Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried, that he rose, and that he appeared. And believing that, we stand. That's the gospel. That's what the Lord wants us to call to mind when we're finding ourselves doubting. That's the thing that makes us stand. And if life is getting to be so overwhelming, we can believe in that and fall on that and stand on that again. It's what sustains us. Because it's all about what Jesus did. How is unbelief cured? By the cross of Christ. And what he was willing to do in love for us. Always confident in his father. Some might say, what about the garden? Where he said, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's faith. So what does faith look like? Is it always confident, always strong? You know, Paul said to Timothy, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Gosh, did I not give you everything I needed to give you? Oh. Where's my Bible at? Oh, well, oh, here it is. I want to read this to you. It is so, it is so cool. I want to read this to you. Here, Paul is ministering to the young evangelist Timothy. He's facing all kinds of challenges. And Paul is, is caring for him. You know, he even tells him at one place to drink a little wine for his stomach problems. Apparently, he's just all tied up in knots. And, and, and yet Paul isn't afraid to encourage Timothy like a, a, a godly father, like a pastor, like a friend, to, to, to embrace and carry out it's called I want to read it to you it's 1 Timothy 6 fight the good fight of faith Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Sounds like confirmation, doesn't it? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold to eternal life to which you've been called. You know, there are stupid fights, pointless fights, tragic fights, but there's a good fight. It's the good fight of faith. It's 
saying, Lord, I, I'm struggling with my faith. You know, it takes faith to say, Lord, I'm struggling with why you're not answering my prayers. It takes faith to say, Lord, I'm really struggling with this pet sin that I keep wanting to get rid of, and yet I'm still drawn to it. It takes faith to say that. Faith looks to the one who can help us across all the different ways we have unbelief that we're wrestling with. Faith willingly says, Lord, I'll try to do a better job of saying my prayers. Faith says, I'm going to try to do a better job of loving my enemies. Faith says, I'm going to try to extend more mercy to my neighbor who keeps driving over my sprinkler heads. It takes faith to admit that we're struggling with our faith. But that's what faith does. And that's what the good fight of faith is all about. Paul talks about the, the armor, the spiritual armor, in Ephesians 6. And one of the things he mentions is the shield of faith. So the shield of faith to deflect all the arrows of the devil who's always accusing us. And sometimes we find ourselves a little too hard on ourselves. And faith says, I'm forgiven. And faith says, I'm beloved. And faith says, I'm a child of God. So that's what real faith is. Trusting in the Lord, looking to him, acknowledging how we struggle. And in those things that we find ourselves struggling with, God is doing something there as well. Let's read this together. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, how many of you, when you lock your keys in the car and you realize it too late, brutal, rude awakening epiphany, the season of epiphany, you say, oh, happy, happy, joy, joy. <laughs> Anybody? Or are you working on that? I, I'll tell you, again, for me, it's like I'm supposed to be joyful here. <laughs> Not doing so good at being joyful here, whatever's going on. Uh, but God is at work training us just like he trained the Father. Just like he trained the whole congregation. And though those challenges, when they come, aren't that joyful, God is at work honing your faith and my faith. Not so that we trust in ourselves, but that we humbly trust in the one who laid down his life for us, who slayed the Goliath of our unbelief, so that we know we're loved, no matter how feeble we can feel in our faith. And today, we once again gather in this place to confess our faith. Even as we've been confessing our faith during the course of this last week, and as we look to the horizon of this new week, we know that we have the victory and that the battle is the Lord's in your life and my life. And though there are times in your life and my life where it's hard to believe that, we know that God is at work. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, thank you for confessing your faith at Christ Lutheran Church this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God, the peace that goes beyond all that we understand, may that peace from God... Guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.